loops of growth and of erosion and of success to the successful, balanced by negative feedback loops so that they're held in check. They're not completely gone. You need growth and yeast and development in systems, but you can't let them grow out of bounds. There has to be something to hold them in, some kind of feedback mechanism that says, the fish are getting too low. We've gone too far. We've got to stop, or whatever the equivalent is. Third, this is a basic systems point. Systems do not work, cannot work. No system can be managed if it's information. The, the information to the actors in the system is noisy, is distorted, is unclear, is overwhelming, is deliberately false. Systems have to have clean, clear, quick, compelling information which includes, I think, the worst thing. There are there's two worst things in our current uh, information system. One is our prices, which do not tell the truth about full costs. I'm sure Herman Daly and others, Paul Hawken, will also speak about that. We, our price signals that tell us what is cheap and what is expensive and what we can afford are so distorted, we have no way, as consumers, of making intelligent decisions about how to live a sustainable good life in a way that um, is equitable to other people or to the planet. And the second is our media, which of course are, have become virtually worthless as an information system. Um, because they're an entertainment system, they're not an information system. Fourth, there needs to be some kind of sacredness about protecting the resource base. There needs to be some kind of cultural commitment saying to undermine a forest or the soils or the groundwaters or the fish or the natural systems that sustain us is just crazy and we will not do it. We shouldn't even have to put people in jail or fine them for doing it. It should be like we just wouldn't even dream of doing it because that's our life support system. I mean, it's, it should be as obvious to us as if we're scuba diving, we're not going to take the air, t air hose and throw it away. We shouldn't have to convince people of it. We shouldn't have to have laws about it. It just should be so cultural. Um, and that includes, there are a, a whole lot of system stuff I didn't, wasn't able to get into about resilience and self-organization and evolution, those abilities of a system, which are its abilities to change. That includes human technology. And it also includes all of biodiversity. The gene pool and the ecosystems of the planet are nature's mechanisms for resilience, that is, the ability to restore oneself after a, a shock. Self-organization, the ability to, to pull pieces of a system together to function. And evolution, the ability to create whole new things that didn't even exist before. There are both human and natural mechanisms for those characteristics of resources without which a resource cannot be dynamic, it can't change, it can't adapt, and it can't evolve. All of those need to be sacred. And finally, social equity. There cannot be huge, huge differences between people. And there especially cannot be people who are desperate for even the ability to maintain their, their basic lives. Otherwise, I don't think a system can function. It just can't function. Now, I want to come back, if I can find it, to a slide I showed so early on that it's completely buried, which is the one about the, where the important intervention points are in systems. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll end by telling you a good fish, fishing story, which illustrates this, this final point very well. Um, a friend of mine named D. Hawk is a guy who invented uh, visa, the Visa card, among other things. Um, and he has a rather interesting view on systems and how they work. He invents things he calls chaotic systems, and I'm not going to go into where that came from. But one of the places he is trying out his idea of systems is with the now idle fishermen uh, who used to fish George's Bank off of New England, which used to be the world's most uh, prolific fishery, and which is now basically closed down. 
there's, there's, there are no fish, the, there's no one allowed to fish, and the fishermen have nothing to do. So D is bringing them together and saying, what have we done here, and how could we keep from ever, ever, ever doing it again? And they're talking and talking. D himself doesn't tell people how to fix systems, he, because he knows that they have to figure it out for themselves. And after about a year of talk, he tells me, the fishermen said, they started writing the principles to run the fishing system, if they ever managed to get a fishing system back again. And principle one, the first thing they wrote was, we, the fishermen, must be the stewards of the entire ocean food chain. We've got to protect everything that lives in the ocean and keep that ecosystem healthy. We have to keep out pollution. We have to prevent overfishing. We have to stop bottom trawling, which basically plows the ocean up. We have to be the stewards of that system that, that supports us. Number one, then out of that first realization come a whole lot of rules about how they're going to govern themselves. And I, I heard that and I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is a breakthrough. This is, uh, pardon the expression, a paradigm change. Um, this is a whole new way of thinking, out of which can evolve a system which will mean laws and rules and incentives and ways of informing each other and monitoring on the various populations in the ocean and how they're doing. Information will start flowing. They're going to create, out of that insight about who they are and what they're committed to, they're going to create a new system that won't be the one that leads to a crash. And it led me to think about where do systems come from? If we have an unsustainable system, if we have a system in which markets and technology, which, by the way, are tools that I am not against, it's only the way we are using them now that is causing them to further our unsustainability. But why do we have a system that causes us all in our daily purchases, our, the way we live our life, to bring our planet down on our heads? Why, where did that come from? And the more I think about it, the more I think that the, the progenitor of systems is well, that'll work. Is mindsets, is worldviews, is paradigms, whatever you want to call it. If you get it, if you get how we are interrelated with the environment, and that all of the throughputs that run our lives come from the environment, go back to the environment, and that we cannot be out of balance, then you start inventing new functions and purposes. For the first thing you see is that growth is one of the stupidest purposes ever invented by any culture. We've got to have an enough. And then you start saying, well, what does that mean? And you start inventing some whole new sustainable system that I myself can't fully see at this point, but I think a lot of the thinkers in this series are contributing to the ideas of how that works. As an individual, you and I have almost no power when we are playing a game as an element of a system that forces us to do things that we know are unsustainable. There's very little we can do. You can't check out every pair of sneakers to see if it was made by prison labor in China or by impoverished 12-year-olds in Honduras. The system doesn't help us to, to be in solidarity with poor people far away. On this level, there's, there's some things we can do, and we should do all we can. But where we really begin to have power is when we go up here. And we start saying, how is any of our stuff made? How is it helping anybody that we are using the equivalent of indentured slaves to produce the stuff of the industrial world? Why are we doing this? Why are we overfishing every fish stock in the world? Where are we going to be when we finish doing that? Um, the question of growth, if, if you just listen around you to the um, mindset, the current culture, telling you how growth is going to solve a problem, if you just, every time you hear that, start saying, growth of what? And why? And for whom? And who pays the cost? And how long can it last? And what's the cost to the planet? And how much is enough? Just do that. 
you're going to screw up mindsets. People are going to hate it. But, but, you, but that's what's needed, is to start rethinking at this level. Even if you don't know the answers to those questions, and hardly anybody does, because we don't ask them, but you've got to admit, those are good questions. Growth of what? For whom? At what cost? Paid by whom? For how long? And how will that fit within the capacity of the planet to support it? And when will we get there? When will we have enough? Where are we going anyway? Those are mindset upsetting questions, paradigm upsetting questions. Challenge the success to the su successful loops. Bring everybody into the process. These are the, these are the places, the only places that I know of, from which we can truly, and I believe we can, because I see the other, my other colleagues in this, in this series, and I see many, many people around me waking up and asking the right questions and trying to find the answer. I was with a group of your uh, administrators this morning trying to say, you know, for University of Michigan, what would it take to make this a sustainable place? What are our throughputs anyway? Where do they come from in nature? Where do they go to? How could we, how could we contribute to being part of the solution instead of being uh, kind of mindless elements tossed around the system here, which tells us that gas is cheap, so go out and buy a big car and burn it up? Um, the, the, the good news is that mindsets are changing. And they're changing in just the ways that this whole series is about. You are privileged to hear the people who are beginning to define the new way of thinking, which will create a new system, which will be sustainable. That's all. Thank you. On three, on three by, sorry folks, three by five cards to get those questions flowing down. But let me start out and, and with this general question. You have emphasized how important systems thinking is for understanding the whole challenge of sustainability. But why is it so difficult for the Homo sapiens, say, in this room to be systems thinkers? Why is it so difficult? Are we programmed? not to be systems thinkers? I don't know the answer. <laughs> Oops, is this on? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I suspect that it's, that I'm not sure I go along with the premise of it. I think that, uh, I think that children are natural systems thinkers. I think that many other cultures besides our culture raise people to be natural systems thinkers, mainly because they're people who are involved, who are deeply embedded in real systems and observant. And furthermore, their systems are sufficiently limited that they get the feedback right away and they begin to learn. I think that there is something we do systematically in our education to take that out of us. I think it has to do with reductionism, that which I was trained in, and which I actually love. I love science. I like taking things apart to see what their parts are. Um, and I think I don't want to throw out reductionism, but I think we somehow need to learn it in such a way that our instinctive, and I, I've met many people who have never gone near any systems training course or book, who are very good systems thinkers. And I think our intuition is very good. In, I think there's not anybody who doesn't say, hey, you know, if we catch too many fish, there won't be any fish left. I mean, I don't think that's so hard to get. But there is something in our culture, I think it's the Western industrial culture, that somehow tells us that that intuition is to be kept silent because there's this reductionistic intellectual argument telling us that it's OK to go ruin our life support system. Given that answer, <laughs> um, what should the University of Michigan do to encourage uh, more systems thinking in both its students and its faculty? 
Well, I could start with that professor right there, Anjali Sastri, and tell her to teach a great systems course because she's a very good systems trained person. All right. <laughs> um, I, uh, my own university, systems, by the way, is very hard to fit into universities for an obvious reason. I mean, I, I go flipping around with my systems from economics to anthropology to ecology uh, to history, uh, and, and one does because this is a general tool. You can, you can model physiology and why the, how the human body maintains its blood sugar level. That's a systems question. Um, you can talk about why cancer cells grow out of control. That's a systems question. Um, it fits everywhere in the university, and therefore, the u u most universities' judgment about it is that it fits nowhere. Um, and I don't care where it fits. Actually, the places where it is taught, sometimes it's taught in business schools, sometimes it's taught in engineering schools, sometimes it's taught in ecology or biology. Uh, in my university, it's taught in environmental studies, which is a proper interdisciplinary place for it to be. But um, I, I think it actually the best teaching I know on systems is going on not at all at the university level, but in middle schools. 11 and 12-year-olds get this stuff instantly. And um, that might be a better place to at least to start because the, there isn't such a rigid division in the classroom be between the people who teach X and the people who teach Y. Uh, so maybe, maybe we should start sooner. And then you could do remedial classes here at the university. Very good. A whole new industry. <laughs> I have quite a few questions here. People would like to hear. I know you could talk for hours, but briefly, what are you trying to do at Cobb Hill Farm and oh. your eco village? Oh, I was hoping somebody would ask. Yes, I was. <laughs> oh, what are we trying to do? I'm trying to, I'm trying to make myself make this short. Um, I've been trying to live in a sustainable way ever since all this stuff hit me, which was roughly 27 years ago, um, because I realized immediately that my own life was out of, out of sync with um, what's required for a sustainable life. And so I had, I, the first thing I did as a result of all this knowledge was to turn my own life into an ongoing experiment, which has been at least amusing. Uh, <laughs> and, and often, I mean, we've done a lot of things that have just um, gone down in flames, and we've done some things that have been really wonderful, that have taught us a lot, and that I think over time have made us, have taught us with absolute conviction that we can live, we can at least move our lives much more toward sustainability, not only without decreasing their quality, but greatly increasing the quality of life. And a lot of, the, of my own personal experiment in this has been on a farm, an organic farm, um, because I, I immediately saw the problems with food production um, in a sustainable way. I'm totally convinced that we can grow food sustainably, and many, many farmers at all sizes and levels in all parts of the world are doing that. I myself have played around with that, but more important, I've gotten to know the people who are doing it for a living and doing it well. Anyway, so we fool with energy system. You know, you can do all sorts of backyard tinkering about this stuff. Um, one of the things that became very clear to me early on was, first of all, I had a house, an old, decrepit and terrible New England farmhouse that was way too big for a world uh, where people needed houses. And so we turned it into a sort of shared house and various, various wonderful characters have lived there with us over the years. Children of all ages, all kinds of, I could write a novel, someday I will. Um, anyway, through that I learned very quickly that we have no idea in this culture how to live communally. We're really bad at it, bad. Everybody, including me, uh, has all the wrong habits. We leave our dirty dishes around for other people, you know. Um, and so I started working on living communally because sharing is clearly a part of, use, of getting a much higher value from a capital plant or from a resource stream. And uh, I've learned a lot from my uh, housemates and from our experiments. And I think um, I've learned about as much as I can given the size farm and the size house that we have. And I've always wanted to work even harder on community. I, I, know there, I now know there are many skills that one can learn. There are people who can teach you about consensus decision making, about conflict resolution, about living in a way that is at least minimally thoughtful about the people with whom one lives. Um, 
and so on. And so I wanted to really do the next experiment. And the next experiment is turning out to be <laughs> a, a much bigger farm three miles away, uh, which will have 22 families living together, not all in one house, but we will have one common house uh, and individual units. And we are still in the process. We've got the land. We've got the engineering done. We're getting permitted right now. I could go on forever about that. Uh, and we're trying to make it as green as we can, as low throughput as we can afford. Um, and we're learning an immense, we're going to, quote, consensus school with Quakers and with people who know how to reach consensus in an efficient way and not sit in meetings all day. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's such fun. Oh, I have never done anything so hard in my life, and I've never learned so much so fast, and I've never had so much fun. And we're not anywhere near ready to move in yet. Um, and I'll just give you one. Uh, the current thing we're stuck, we're always stuck. The current thing we're stuck on is raising $4 million for a construction loan. We are developers. We never realized what it was like to be developers. And um, trying to convince banks that they should invest in a community where there are going to be composting toilets, where everybody jointly owns the land, where we've taken the development rights off the land, um, where, uh, and, and so on. The banks think we're nuts. And they say, this is not sellable on the market. We'll never get our money back, and so on and so on. So, um, so educating banks is the current job before us. <laughs> what? What was the question? How many people do you need to make offers on it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we could also, we have room for 11 more families. It's going to be a big uh, organic farm and CSA and stuff like that. It's fun. This is the bottom, you know, you know, there's no one right way to do that kind of experiment with your life. Do, you do it differently in cities than you do in the country. Um, you do it differently in the East Coast than you do it in uh, uh, Central America or whatever. But um, I, if there's anything I urge you to do, it's take your life and do something crazy like that with it. That something, something that moves in the direction of sustainability. I don't know, sell your car and get a bicycle or an electric car or, you know, whatever. Play. I mean, the, the, the thing I can tell you after 30 years of doing this is you don't really uh, have to endanger yourself or your family <laughs> in the process, <laughs> financially or in any other physical way. And secondly, very sincerely, you will discover so much better ways to live than they're trying to sell you at the mall. So much better ways. All right, some further questions. <laughs> you told us that we need to instill a sense of reverence for the natural systems and life support systems. How do we do that in this very uh, secular society? What role do you see for spirituality in bringing about this renewed reverence? I'm not the spirituality expert of the sustainability team. Um, I, I have it, I um, practice it. Actually, it was farming that taught that to me. Um, I, having to interact with an ecosystem in order to get my food um, taught me so much, continues, doesn't, never ends, continues to teach me so much. Um, I don't even know what I mean by that spirituality. I just know that, um, let me give you a very explicit example. On our new farm where we are building the Cobb Hill community, we have 20 acres, period, of fine bottom land soil, which uh, in New England is a big field. And the farmers among us, uh, of whom I'm one but not the only one, have basically said, over our dead bodies will one inch of that field go to development. That field's sacred. I don't care where your road should go. I don't care where the septic tanks ought to leach to. Um, not that field. And what we're discovering is everybody we work with, the architects, the engineers, the banks, the everybody, is finding that field just infinitely attractive to run roads on or to put leach fields into or whatever. And it's a constant battle because it's really cheap to run. We only have a gray water leach field, but we don't have much space for it. And it's so cheap to put it there compared to anywhere else we could put it. 
It's so cheap to run the roads where it's flat. And we're just, we're just saying, no, no, don't even mention it. And they finally have gotten it. The rest of the community, who aren't farmers, are finally picking that up from us. And so when the architect says, look, I've just moved the road three feet this way, everybody says, no. <laughs> everybody, not even just the farmers. That's an example. It's not spiritual. It's very practical in, my, in, in our point of view. That's where we get our food from. That's our livelihood. That's not where you build roads. <laughs> what connections uh, do you make between the rapid evolution of the internet and electronic commerce and prospects for sustainability. Will this lead to the system of more success for the successful, or will it liberate those that are less fortunate? That depends on the mindset with which we develop it. And of course, the mindset with which it is developing at the moment is unsurprisingly success to the successful. Uh, tr trash, commercialism, pornography, violence, blah, blah, blah. And um, tremendous information overload with no sense of quality or necessity of information. So I find it very disheartening, and I spend very little time on the internet, except for email. Um, and, but when I do use it for what I do use it for, it's great. I mean, to get the statistics I need, or to, to talk to my friends in, in India, or whatever. It's great. So like the, market, like the market, like technology, like all of these very powerful social tools, informational tools that we, as a species, invent, this could be terrific. And it could be the end of us. And it just depends on the, the mentality with which we use it. I feel the same way about genetic technologies uh, and so on. I, at the moment, it's all run by the wrong mentality about owning and more and, and shove more stuff down our throats and, and overload us with trivial information with no sense of what information we really need. But it doesn't need to be that way. The technology itself is neutral. What's important is the mindset that's running it and owning it. I think this question is from somebody that read one of your recent articles. What is similar or what connects why Asian economies are collapsing and Democrats are cutting welfare in the United States? Do you believe, truly believe in these long waves, long waves? That's almost not a fair question because it involves, for everybody to understand, both the question and the answer involves another whole long systems lecture, <laughs> which I gave in that article that somebody clearly read. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of a short way of getting everybody in on the conversation. It's another interesting system study, not done by me. I just wrote an article about it, done at MIT. Um, which has to do with another thing that, sis that economic systems always do, although nobody actually makes them do it, which is oscillate. And we have business cycles going up and down, and there are also some longer cycles that are harder to perceive because they're very long, uh, like about the same as the lifetime of a human being. So rarely do we get to see it one repeat, so we don't catch on that they are cycles. Um, and this was a system very interesting fantastic system study about why do economies do that. Uh, what more do I need? <laughs> read the works of Jay Forrester and John Sturman if you want to know more about it, or read that article was in Whole Earth magazine last summer, I think, um, which is a layman's explanation of it. I believe that analysis I watched for 25 years, that analysis explained better than anything else in the world what was happening to the economy. It says we are at the bottom of a long wave right now, 70 year long wave, which explains a lot about why Asian economies are collapsing and um, why all political systems are getting swinging to the conservative side. They swing to the conservative side at the bottom of the long wave. If you're around long enough, they'll swing back to the democratic, or the liberal side at the top of the long wave. Um, and it's, uh, it's just one more example of cool system stuff that I don't have time to tell you about right now. Here's some more cool system stuff. <laughs> you say that optimistically that you see mindsets changing, but your models still sh show crashing by 2030. 
Are we too late to change these minds? I showed you one run of that model. I showed you another run which didn't crash. It's very important when you see the system's outcomes not to take them as predictions. They are what if questions. What if our mindsets don't change? What if our mindsets do change? What if technology goes faster in the direction?